ask why we're live so early. Um, okay, so I will be share, I'll just share this picture and then come back at five or just before five. Uh, are you seeing that? Did, did you get the messages going on? Yeah, I see it. And hold on. Okay. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, live stream on Facebook. Okay, so now I'm going to sign off. And then actually, I'm going to hang out for a couple minutes. Just like see that it doesn't all fall apart when I, it shouldn't. We've done this before, but. Um, I am going to just like shut my computer down and stuff. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, so really I'm awesome. gonna leave it like that. And then, um, yeah, we'll just come back at uh, at 4.45 or so. So. In about 20 minutes. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, sleep my computer and that'll be that okay all right okay. enjoy the uh, game it's, it, i can still hear you can you still hear me okay. yeah you have to mute yourself because it's still i'm just screen sharing i'm not um okay let me do that because i'm like i don't know how to You, sh you should be able to screen share now, just in case. I, I just turned that on. Although no, you should. I'm, I'm sharing now. I see it. Oh, yeah. Okay. But we have people watching. For those of you who are uh, on Facebook with us, um, we're turning on a little early, uh, but we will be back at about uh, at five to go live with our actual office hours. So just bear with us.
Hi. We'll be getting started here in just a few minutes. Sorry, not muted. Uh, so I stopped sharing uh, my screen so people can see we're live um, on Facebook. Hello to everyone out in Facebook land. Just giving it, a, we'll get a, a few more minutes, let people get in. We usually don't start till about 5.05 .05 anyway. We'll get started here in just about a few more minutes. Just 
putting the, the word out there. If you guys haven't already, if you're on Facebook, please feel free to share um, this live stream to your page. It is live on the Healthcare for All Los Angeles page. So feel free to share that. Hi, Paul. Hey, Gina. Hi. Boy, I got some good stuff. Here are we, oh, we're live on Facebook, whoops. Hi, everybody on Facebook. Yeah, um, you know, Ron couldn't be here today, so we went live a little early uh, just to make sure um, there were no hiccups, so. But we're live on Facebook as usual. We'll be getting started in a few minutes, getting right into it, um, just getting a few more people viewers and all well yeah i uh my friend um i was on the pda meeting and they were talking about i have a friend who's autoimmune uh believes she's autoimmune compromised and i said you need to get the vaccine and she's afraid to so um so i finally was able to encourage her to get it and well i mean she should you know, talk it over with her doctor. I mean, there are certain contraindications, but you know, most of the most autoimmunes, um, I think, have gotten it. I mean, I have a cousin and a sister-in-law who have lupus who have gotten it, uh, gotten the vaccine, not COVID, um, because of course, getting COVID would have been detrimental to them, and they were perfectly fine. They actually had less of a reaction than I did uh, to the Moderna vaccine, which. By the way, just to talk about reactions really quick, I'll be on my soapbox here as I burn about three more minutes. Uh, reactions are different. Um, you know, an immune response, I'm sorry, is different than an, an actual reaction. Um, so if you have a vaccine, you get that little fever, you get some chills, you get, um, you know, things like that, that is more of an immune response um, versus an actual allergic reaction, which would be breaking out in hives, for example. Right. Um, people think that the, that's the vaccine making them sick. And I'm like, no, that is your body saying, I'm going to <laughs> recognize this next time. Um, and we're going to uh, not allow it in. Um, and so... I had an immune response probably stronger than I had with any other vaccine and I was down for a day and I was back the next day. So, um, you know, just putting that out there. Um, I've talked about this. I think I even live streamed it as I was sitting with 102 fever, but it was just so that sure. people could see that the difference between an immune response and an actual reaction um, to the vaccine. And six months later, it is now August. And actually, yeah, almost six, I think I got my second dose August 8th. So it is six months to the day of my second dose of the Moderna vaccine. I have not grown a third eyeball. I still have two ears. Um, <laughs> I cannot control the weather, even though I really, really want that because I would make it rain a lot here in California. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't have any cool, cool you know, mutations to report. Um, and so six months later, we're all, I'm doing fine. Um, and so I do encourage everyone if we're ever going to get past COVID um, and make it a thing of the past, well, it probably will just be a circulating thing, but not something that will be so deadly. Um, we have to get vaccinated. There just isn't any other way at this point. So I'm hoping that those still on the fence um, will you know, feel compelled to do it. Um, and, and if they're not compelled, please seek out um, reputable sources of information. The WHO, if you don't trust the CDC, go to the WHO. Um, talk to your doctors, um, talk to nurses, um, do not go to the school of YouTube. Um, and so I really, you know, would hope that those, you know, people on the fence would, you know, get information from good sources. Um, please do not trust Fox News. Any, well, even Fox News is now promoting vaccines. So I guess, sure, go ahead and listen to Fox News. She's a Fresenius <laughs> patient, by the way, too. I'm sorry, what was that? She's a Fresenius patient. Oh, and she's for Cynthia. So yeah, I'm sure in the dialysis clinics, for sure, they are promoting vaccinations because they, A, don't even have the staff to um, 
to take care of patients. And, and last part of my high horse, or excuse me, not my high horse, my soapbox, when it comes to vaccines and COVID is that I just saw a letter from the Board of Nursing in Florida basically giving everyone the green light as long as you have a nursing license here in the United States, you can practice in Florida because their shortage is gonna be so bad and they're experiencing such a high surge. Now that is unheard of because when you wanna practice nursing and if you're not in a compact state, um, it, then if you want to practice nursing, let's say I in California as a registered nurse want to practice in Florida, I would have to go through their, uh, their process of a nursing endorsement. I wouldn't take the boards again, but I have to get my nursing license endorsed, which is a process, fingerprinting, et cetera, that I have to go through to, um, to get my, in my license in Florida. Well, they're just, they're ripping the rug up off of that and saying, we're so desperate for nurses right now. We, as long as you have a license that's active in any other state in the United States, including Hawaii, um, you can practice here with no problem. You can just walk right, basically get hired right away. And that is unheard of. That is a terrible situation to be in. Granted, yes, you, you know, it should, the state guidelines should be the same for nursing, but at the same time, you know, the fact that they're skipping such a, a integral spot, um, you know, I, I, I think that, and it's unnecessary, you know, like it didn't have to be this way. Like uh, Maureen, you were saying about Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, you know, that was a natural disaster that happened that required that fast response. We've been in this pandemic for well over a year now. We should not have to be in this still, this, this immediate emergent response. We should have been had this under control. Um, okay, soapbox over, it is 5.07. Um, welcome to the 20th Cal Care office hours, um, the people strike back. If you notice uh, by our Zoom backgrounds, we got a little bit of a theme going on here. Um, and so I wanna welcome all of you guys to our 20th Cal Care office hours. We are thrilled to be celebrating the 20th one. And I can't believe it's actually number 20 already. Time sure does fly when you're talking about something you love. Um, so with that being said, CalCare is a joint operation with Healthcare for All Los Angeles and PNHP. Um, so shout out to them and us. <laughs> and, and those of you who are watching us from Facebook land, uh, hello. And thank you guys for being patient. So what is CalCare? Um, and those of you who are, have been joining us over these last 20 episodes, episodes, segments, whatever we wanna call them. Um, you guys probably know what I'm getting ready to do to talk about CalCare, but CalCare is a, a bill, a, AKA AB 1400 um, that you see uh, on our backgrounds here. And thank you also, shout out to Bronwyn Major for designing this background and actually coming up with the theme. And she even gave me a nickname, I am Jedi Gina, <laughs> your lovely uh, neighborhood friendly nurse. Um, who gets on her rants and goes on, you know, gets on a soapbox every now and then. And so I want to uh, go over um, what CalCare is, AB 1400, a bill that is currently in our assembly, um, waiting to get all the love and all the yes votes from all the assembly members who are going to be excited to vote yes on AB 1400 or else. No, I'm kidding. Um, the people may strike back. Uh, so I'm going to go over what CalCare actually is. I'm going to share my screen and it's going to work the first time because I have set this up. Aha. Um, the Jedi magic is already working. So CalCare and, uh, CalCare is a guaranteed healthcare for all. Um, and here in California, it is the solution to this broken healthcare system. And I'm pretty sure everybody knows this healthcare system is broken. Um, it will guarantee healthcare as a human right in the state of California, providing comprehensive high quality healthcare for all, all, um, emphasis on the all, uh, just like the national Medicare for all. So what this does is gives us universal coverage. We're saying everybody in, nobody out. Um, if you haven't heard this before, we say this a lot, everybody in, nobody out. Um, everybody, and that means regardless of your race, sex, gender, country of origin, your disability status, immigration status, marital status, age, and income, emphasis on the income, um, gets the care that you get the care that you need regardless of your ability to pay a single public program. Um, if you guys notice, there are more health plans out there than I can name. I think California alone has 
maybe over 100. Um, and so we're trying to create a single public program, publicly funded through progressive taxation. What is progressive taxation? Well, to be simply put, um, Jeff Bezos, who makes a lot more money than me, should pay a little bit higher taxes than me, right? Makes sense. Seems fair. That's progressive taxation. Um, to cover all the necessary care in California, eliminating billions in bloat and waste and saving the people thousands on their health care costs. I wish it could save us billions uh, personally, but I wasn't a billionaire to begin with, so I'm not going to be greedy. It can save me a few thousand, though, um, and I would greatly appreciate that. Um, that means that could be a vacation. That could be saving for your kids, you know, college fund, new car, motorcycle. I don't know, Corvette. I don't know. Um, anything that you could do with those savings, you could buy a house, maybe. I don't know. Um, so anyway, that's what this is going to do. It's going to provide fully comprehensive benefits. This includes medical, dental, hearing, vision, mental health, prescription drugs, long-term care, and more. I want to emphasize on this. This is super important because even this is better than Medicare right now. Medicare as it stands kind of really skimps you on the dental hearing vision part. Mental health is included, but that's a system we got to work on after CalCare gets passed. Prescription drugs, there's a big hole called the donut hole right now in Medicare. And uh, long-term care, well, guess what? They don't really cover long-term care. It covers skilled nursing care for up to 100 days per benefit period. Um, and so there are a lot of current little gaps in Medicare that CalCare here for California would fill. So this is so important that we get this done because we not only would have Medicare for all, we would have Medicare for all like the platinum edition. All decisions about care would be made between you and your doctor and nurses and not insurance companies. If you need care, it should not be regulated by somebody who is not currently seeing or treating you. Um, health plans, they do employ, you know, nurses and doctors to do utilization review, but those nurses and doctors are not looking at you. They're not currently treating you. They're not prescribing and, and looking you dead in your face and looking at the current situation. What they're, uh, they're doing are looking at guidelines. Do, does what is going on with you match this guideline? No, denied. Yes, approved. And so the problem is with that is that we're human beings and human beings not all the time fit with in a guideline. Sometimes you might check every single box except one. And then from there, it is, you know, to be denied based on that, because the person that's actually in charge of your care, which is not your current doctor, is saying, well, they didn't miss, they missed that box. I got to deny it. That's not cool. So it should be between your doctors or nurses and your, uh, excuse me, and you. Um, if you need that care. The doctors have been trained. They know they're not going to be out here just doing going willy-nilly. We still have guidelines to work within, but if you need something, you should be able to get it if it's a need. Um, so then you are going to also have the freedom to choose your care provider. So under care, Cal care, they, um, there will be no more in-network, out-of-network. You know, you get your card and you see all those different numbers and you see like out-of-network, not covered. Um, with CalCare, that goes away. You'll have the freedom to choose any doctor or hospital you like. So if you're under currently under an HMO, you have to stay within your HMO's network right now, right? But what if you really don't like your doctor? And because you don't like your doctor, you're not going to see your doctor because the process to change your doctor has been so complicated, you don't want to deal with it. Well, CalCare, if, as long as these providers are taking CalCare, which most of them will, you get to go say, you know what? I like the doctor over there. That doctor understands me. That doctor is part of my community. That doctor, you know, I feel like would be able to handle my care better. I'm going to go see this doctor under CalCare. You call that doctor's office. Is that doctor, does that doctor have more, you know, availability on his schedule? Yes, I would like to schedule an appointment. Bing, bang, boom, done. No more in network, no more out of network, no more. Do you take Anthem? Do you take this? No, no, none of that. And you get to see a doctor that you can build a relationship with, that you trust, that you know that you'll get the care that you need and that you'll be compliant with and you'll be an overall healthier person. There's that. Free at the point of service, point blank period, free at the point of service. So you go and right now you have to pay a $25 copay to see your PCP, a $40 copay to see your uh, specialist. Nope, you just show them your CalCare card and they tell you to have a seat and wait for the doctor. Point blank period. Just transition. So this is very important. Um, just transition is basically, it's kind of like a safety net, safety net for those people who are currently working in this industry, the insurance industry, working for medical groups who may, you know, um, 
see themselves being, you know, um, unemployed or the insurance companies may start laying off or furloughing, a just transition creates funding and programs to protect and support displaced workers in this industry. So that this bill actually and thinks about the workers because the workers should not suffer at the, you know, due to the bad leadership. You know, they're doing their job. They're coming in, they're getting hired, they're doing their job. Um, and, you know, while we are doing something that's great for the overall well being of all Californians, we are acknowledging that this could, you know, become an issue for certain people who work in this industry. And we're going to make sure you're, we got you, we got your back. And, provide a just transition for you. Um, and so, you know, more to come on that, but that's really important. I liked, I love emphasizing this because you don't see this a lot in legislation. Um, you know, to think about the people is so important. And that's why I really love CalCare. Um, and then patient care based on patient need. No more financial incentives uh, to avoid providing care. No more sending you to a provider that may not be, um, have as much equipment or be able to have as many resources to treat your condition just because um, they might have a lower contracted rate with your insurance at that time. Um, you get the care that you need. If you need to get a higher level of care at a high level center, then you're gonna go to that high level center and get that care. Um, instead of just being sent all through the loop-de-loops the -loop and the, the maze, the labyrinth of, oh, well, you know what, we're going to approve you to go to see this provider. Not just be, not because, you know, they do the best care, they're the best one to provide the service, but well, our, our, our rates are better there. Um, no more of that, because we find that actually that does cause more bloat and waste because you still end up having to probably go to that higher level center anyway. You just had to make another pit stop you don't have time for that. That's not fair to you. So you're going to get the patient care based on your need. If that care is at UCLA, fine. If it's not, then great. But it doesn't matter. If you need it, you should get it. And that is CalCare. AB 1400, that will pass in January because our assembly members are enthusiastic to vote for this. And with that being said, I want to introduce our guest um, here from CNA. And I also, I forgot to give a shout out to CNA. I always do that when I share the, the um, seven basic principles because they made the graphic. <laughs> So shout out to CNA, the California Nurses Association, who are our driving force for this bill. Um, and so, and they made that lovely graphic that I read from most, almost every single week. Um, and that makes it very, very easy for me. So I want to introduce Phil Kim from CNA, who is joining us today um, to help us to talk about CalCare and to maybe give us some updates about what's going on. Um, things are starting to warm up and heat up as we are heading into the fall. January is right around the corner. We're going to blink and it's going to be Christmas. So uh, Commander Kim, that's where, thank you, Erica. Um, I'm going to turn this over and let Commander Kim have the mic. Sure. Well, thank you, Gina. And thank you, Healthcare for All Los Angeles. Um, it's great to be here. Can't believe it's the 20th office hour. Uh, I just want to start by thanking all of you for keeping this issue at the forefront and for organizing and for doing some awesome policy education as well. I've actually learned a lot from some of your previous uh, guest speakers. So thank you so much for doing this. And I want to let you know that everybody at CNA really appreciates every all the work that you're doing down in Los Angeles. So Thank you, everybody. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to give a, a quick update about um, CalCare and the return of AB 1400 in January. That was my uh, Star Wars sort of tie. Um, and uh, yeah, we, uh, by the way, we just did, I know that uh, you can't see this um, on Facebook, but maybe, maybe somebody can post this, uh, but we just did a um, strategy call a couple weeks ago and uh, we announced some new campaign activities that we're focusing on for the next five months leading up to January. Because as Gina said, we uh, have January is when the bill returns to the assembly. And basically it has to, it's a really compressed type timeline. It has to go through the assembly health committee, the assembly appropriations committee and have a floor vote all by January 31st. And that's because it's a two year bill. It's returning from this year to next year. So it's a more compressed timeline. Uh, and then when we're successful, uh, it, it'll go to the Senate and we'll have a more spaced out timeline for the Senate side. But all of this is geared towards getting ready for the assembly. And probably the, the biggest piece of this of the four uh, things we're announcing is that um, we announced a CalCare district leaders program. So there are 33 priority districts that we selected across the state out of the 80 assembly districts. 
and they are members, Democrats on the Assembly Health Committee, Democrats on the Assembly uh, Appropriations Committee, uh, and then Democrats in deep blue districts where they have no excuse not to support this because overwhelmingly their constituents uh, support guaranteed health care for all single payer health care. So um, we have this uh, whole plan. We're recruiting uh, leaders who are willing to step up and lead the organizing efforts in their district with text bank parties, phone bank parties, and ultimately, as we get closer to January, we're asking folks to lead legislative visits with their assembly members. Uh, and that's gonna be towards the end because the first two sort of phases there are, are geared towards building support in the district because we still need to identify more supporters and build awareness for this issue. Uh, we're doing a lot of texting. We're planning on texting 2.65 million voters in California in these 33 priority districts. So we're gonna need your help with the text bank parties, uh, as well as texting from home, there's a, a volunteer from home uh, option. And these are all listed in the handout. So if somebody's posting that in the, um, the Facebook comments or the YouTube comments, check that out. All the activities are listed. But CalCare district leaders in 33 districts, texting from home, you can, you can join us. We're using a platform called Fruitext. If you've never done it before, it's really easy. You, you just need a computer with internet access and you're able to have real conversations with voters. It's actually been really successful because earlier this year we did a lot of texting and we've already identified uh, over 22 or nearly 22,000 uh, CalCare supporters. And we're asking everybody to sign a petition. Uh, and that petition, by the way, is gonna be uh, virtually presented to the assembly members when the district leaders do their visits later in November, December. Um, and then uh, two more things I'll just mention are, we're gonna continue doing these prep meetings and having talking points available for the uh, Healthy California for All Commission. Uh, I know a lot of people are aware of this, but uh, if you're not, the governor and the legislature created this commission that's supposed to uh, study pathways to bringing California to universal healthcare. And uh, we wanna make sure that they put forward a strong recommendation for true single payer guaranteed healthcare and not something watered down that leaves the insurance companies uh, in place. Uh, so we're gonna be, be providing uh, talking points and doing occasional prep meetings. The next commission meeting is August 25th and we're gonna do a prep meeting on August 23rd. I believe it's a Monday. Um, so if you sign up for the commission link in that handout, you can get the updates on that. And then finally, uh, keep, your, uh, keep your calendar marked or uh, save the date. Uh, we're going to do a big virtual uh, day of action on September 25th uh, to uh, highlight the issue and uh, get more petition signatures, more details uh, to be announced. Uh, but basically, uh, I'll, I'll just close this segment with saying that we're in a, uh, a pivotal moment here in American history, I feel like. You know, I know a lot of you were involved in the, the 2016 and 2020 Bernie campaigns uh, or with some of the allied uh, presidential candidates who also supported Medicare for All. Uh, Warren was a, was a Medicare for All supporter, even though she did have her own sort of side plan. Um, but uh, anyway, that's another discussion. Um, but, you know, we're at this moment here in, in politics, and I, I'm just coming out, apologize if I'm a little uh, slow to respond uh, tonight, just because I was in the DSA convention uh, all this past weekend, and this issue was coming up a lot. But, you know, we've got Biden as president. He uh, was not a Medicare for all supporter. You know, he was very clear about that. But obviously, we had to defeat Trump. Uh, so CNA, you know, strongly supported him against Trump, of course. Um, but he's not a Medicare for All supporter. We have a national campaign going on. It's focused on gaining more co-sponsors. And hopefully uh, later this year, there's gonna be a, uh, a Medicare for All hearing in the house. Hopefully Bernie's gonna introduce his companion bill in the Senate real soon. But the, the fact of the matter is on the national level, Democrats hold a majority, but a bare majority. And there's a significant block of conservative Democrats that make Winning Medicare for all this year, extremely hard. We're gonna advance the issue as much as possible. But I, that, the reason why I bring this up is that in California, we don't have that excuse. We have a democratic governor. We have a super majority of Democrats and overwhelming majority of Democrats have the seats of the assembly and the state Senate. Uh, and so I think we have an opportunity here and more of an opportunity here uh, to lead the country on this issue. So that's why this is so important. That said, of course, it's gonna be 
uh, difficult. We're up against a billion dollar industry, uh, three billion dollar industries, the health insurance industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and the corporate hospital industry that are all fighting this tooth and nail. So it's going to take an unprecedented mass movement and a variety of tactics and parallel strategies, applying pressure and doing the organizing. So thank you all. Uh, you know, I'm happy to entertain any any sort of questions, and I'm sure Je uh, Jedi Gina uh, and Maureen and others can uh, jump in as well as needed. Awesome. Thank you so much, Phil, for the update. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, Healthcare for All Los Angeles is definitely here to be a, um, you know, advocate, ally, friend, and, you know, soldier in the battle with uh, CNA. So we are here to lockstep and get this done. Um, and so Maureen uh, was on stack. So we'll go to Maureen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phil, for all the work that you're doing and for your um great organizing and being uh, the conduit of information to us from CNA. Um, I'm wondering if you could share with us um, the conversation at DSA um, around this issue. Are you able to talk to us about that or is that in-house um, stuff? Well, I mean, I can say a little bit, generally speaking, this was a national convention though that happens every two years. Uh, okay. And by the way, this is with my DSA hat on, I guess not my CNA hat on. Right. Um, but um, yeah, there was uh, over a thousand delegates that were just convening uh, on Zoom this past week. Um, and, uh, you know, there were uh, a lot of it was parliamentary procedural stuff, but we were discussing some pretty important issues for our organization for DSA. Uh, and that is uh, setting our priorities for the next couple of years. We created a platform. Um, there was a lot of uh, debate and, uh, you know, Robert's rules, it's that, that that sort of meeting, you know, of course, with a large meeting with over a thousand delegates, you have to do that. But there was a, a really, I guess, a couple emphasis, uh, three things I'll mention. Medicare for all, of course, was reaffirmed as a, as a priority, um, and, and it has been for the last several years, um, as well as state single payer, that's in the platform. Uh, so whoever wrote, I'm not sure who was, took part in writing that, but it was a good healthcare section of the platform. But we're going to continue to focus on electoral politics, which, of course, is tied to winning both Medicare for all and CalCare. Um, there's going to be a strong emphasis on rebuilding the, and revitalizing the labor movement, which I think is going to be necessary for any sort of fundamental progressive change in this country. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there was a whole lot of things discussed. Um, so that's what comes to mind right now. Overall, I'm feeling good that there is a lot of energy you know one more thing i'll say just about the, the sort of dsa bernie campaign general american politics is that you know even though bernie you know did not win the primary like his ideas are carrying forward and obviously as chairman of the uh, budget committee he's doing as much as he can as he can to insert as much progressive stuff into all the bills um but more important than that i think is that all these activists and volunteers did not disappear. Uh, everyone is continuing work on the local level, on the state level. A lot of people are, are getting a lot of campaign experience and they're becoming campaign managers. And a lot of them are actually running for office as well. And I think uh, this is gonna be uh, an important part of, of uh, going forward to have a political revolution in, in this country. We need more regular working class people to get involved in politics, to, to run for office. It's actually not that hard to, to, to do. Uh, you just have to find a good group of people to work with. Um, and uh, obviously you wanna be strategic about it and pick races where you have winning, um, but we need more people to step up and run. So that was definitely one of the uh, uh, discussed issues at the convention. Um, yeah, so a little, little DSA report back. Uh, well, my, I guess I should have been more specific. I was curious as to the um, support for the state's um, efforts and um, if that was controversial at all or if it was pretty much um, um, uh, unanimous or you know, if, if there was any um, difference of opinion about supporting state's bills, especially, especially California. I don't know if, ours, if uh, AB 1400 came up or not, so. Yeah, um, good question. It wasn't really discussed a lot. So, uh, so uh, in that sense, it was not controversial. Uh, those those uh, issues passed through uh, overwhelmingly. Um, yeah, there was a lot of discussion about uh, other things, uh, which I don't need to get into, you know, uh, electoral strategy and whether or not to work within the Democratic Party and, and those kind of things came up. 
but uh, not, uh, I think at this point among uh, the left uh, progressives and socialists, obviously Medicare for all is, um, is the solution. Everybody knows that um, it's just a matter of, and it is among the public too, you know, we all know this. It's just a matter of gaining more active uh, support among the public. So uh, doing a little bit deeper education because everybody says they support Medicare for all now, but not everybody knows, you know, sort of the details of what that means. Uh, which is why I'm appreciative of, of Jedi Gina for going over those principles of CalCare uh, just uh, a minute ago. Yes, the principles are very important. That's also um, in both toolkits, the CNA toolkit and our toolkit, um, just in case you guys want a one sheeter to talk to people about, because that's what this office hours is about. Um, it is about, you know, empowering everyone to go out to their community, talk to and talk to people about AB 1400. Um, and that's what we're doing this for is to basically give you the education you need to answer those hard questions if we can, uh, just to to, um, you know, so that you can go back out and basically it's a teach the teacher type thing where we're basically, you know, each one teach one and trying to get that out there. But that seven basic principles, I have shared it so many times with people who are like, well, what is cow care? What can I, how do I explain cow care, um, you know, without overwhelming somebody? And it literally is that, and it's super simple. I love it. And once again, thank you to CNA for it. Um, Chang Sim, I see you on staff, but really quick, what I wanted to ask Phil, um, when it comes to the temperature of the legislators, I know right now we've been more so trying to, you know, get our strategy together. And I know I'm sure CNA has been doing that too, but, um, and, you know, I know CNA has been, you know, definitely working with a lot of the assembly too. Do you think that now as we're moving towards, you know, we're getting into the fall, unfortunately, summer comes and goes, I think it's one of the quickest seasons of the year. Um, but, do you think that the assembly, does it feel like maybe we're getting, gaining a little bit more attention or traction? Because I know some of them have checked out office hours, even though they, they haven't came into the Zoom. I know they've seen it. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it's too early to say as far as what's going to happen in January, but I do know that um, they're watching very carefully what all of us are doing. And a lot of a number of the uh, co-authors were on our uh, call that we did a couple weeks ago, July 22nd, the uh, CalCare strategy call, and they were also excited about the strategy and the plan, especially the the priority districts and the district leaders. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, and it's an interesting thing that we're doing slightly different, is that among the 33 priority districts are a number of co-authors. We're actually including co-authors on this list of priority districts, and that's for a few reasons. Because one of course, there's more that uh, all assembly members can do, even if they're a co-author and they have their, their name on paper is supporting this. Of course, they can do more to use their platform to advocate for the issue, to push it through, to advance the cause. Um, and, and a number of them are doing that. Um, and, we, you know, we would like all of them to be to using their platform to push for it. Uh, but the other reason is also the ones who are doing that. Uh, would like to see the backup uh, among their constituents when they're taking on a bold position like this. So I think that's the reason, and we heard that a number of the leading co-authors were really excited about our CalCare District Leaders Program, even if it involved their own districts, because they want the backing uh, when they take on these progressive positions. Uh, and then the ones that should be doing more, you know, we'll have a chance for them to hear from their constituents over these next few months, and hopefully that will uh, reach out to them. Awesome. And, and speaking of, I mean, we're all about showing love. You know, um, one thing is that there had, you know, with the there has, you know, there's always seems to be a us versus them with the legislators and the progressives where it seems like we're always at war and that's not the case. So um, I want to give a shout out a, to like Sydney Kamlager and Miguel Santiago, Ash Kalra, um, Wendy Carrillo, um, Mark Gonzalez. They all showed up for us um, at our Medicare for All March here in Los Angeles to help support AB 1400. And they didn't have to. So, you know, we really appreciate that. Um, you know, for them to come out and show up and talk about AB 1400 at a, you know, an event. And so I just always like to say, I'm with you when you're right and they're right and I'm with them. And I just want the other legis legislators to know that we will be with them too, um, you know, when you're with us. And I, you know, there's nothing but love. Like it's easy, so much easier to love than to argue with you. Just let us love you. Just let me love you. 
anyway, um, I'm going to go to Randy's question. He asked on our Facebook, um, what is, can you go over the timeline for the AB 1400? Like when, when it's going to hit in January and kind of like what the path may be. I know you touched on it really briefly, but if you could go just a little bit deeper into that. Sure, I can. Uh, I, from my understanding is that the exact dates haven't been set yet for next year, uh, since it's the next year, next session. Um, so, but based on previous years, uh, it should be early, very, very early January, right after the new year, um, they will reconvene. Uh, and then it has to go through those three uh, areas, the Assembly Health Committee, Assembly Appropriations Committee, and the floor of the Assembly, all by January 31st. So most likely, the health committee part would be somewhere in the first couple of weeks. Uh, and then after that, the appropriations and the floor. Uh, but none of the dates, as far as I know, have been scheduled yet. We're actually, for those of you who are willing to step up and become Cal Care District leaders, um, we're part of the training that we're offering folks is a both a legislative visit training, but also a more detailed legislative process training. Uh, and that's as we get closer to November, uh, and we might have some of the dates by then, but we're gonna uh, in detail go through some of sort of those, those timelines and, and the process of how it works. Awesome, thank you for that. Yeah, and of course, keep, just stay tuned. We're, as soon as we start seeing these dates, there's gonna be actions. I'm pretty, I am 100% am certain there's gonna be actions surrounding these dates. So just stay tuned with us. When these dates get dropped, we're probably gonna organize around them. Probably should be clear in my calendar in January for flying back and forth to Sacramento because I'm pretty sure it's gonna happen. Uh, but um, we're gonna, you know, or have car caravans to Sacramento. Who knows what we're gonna do, but it's going to be something. Um, so then I'm going to go to you, Chang Sim. You uh, had a question? Yeah, I have a question for Phil and then also a comment. And my question is this. Um, for a number of people at HELA, we are not in the districts that, uh, you know, are, have been identified as a target districts. So you're not looking for district leaders and all that. But we want to organize to supplement uh, what, you know, um, the CNA is doing, um, can, you know, can, can, can we apply to, to audit, you said, you know, audit the, the, the training that you, you're, you're having for district leaders, um, you know, um, even if we're not doing the district leader, um, you know, uh, organizing, but we're doing organizing in coordination with CNA to supplement what the CNA is doing. So that's my question. Um, then the my comment, well, maybe you an, an, answer the question and then I can come back and add my comment. Sure, um, I don't know about the auditing. I'll have to get back to you on that. If, if you email us at info at Medicare, the number four all dot org. Um, but what we are uh, having people do and we want people to do is we still have a number of gaps as far as the districts. We have about half the districts covered with district leaders, um, but we are having people um, adopt a district. So if you're willing to um, adopt a nearby district and we help get the organizing efforts started in that district, that's an option. The other thing is that most of these activities right now are virtual, uh, largely because of COVID and the Delta variant. And especially as a, as a nurses union, a, a union of bedside nurses, um, we're taking COVID very, very seriously. So we're, we're primarily doing virtual things uh, and there have been car-based events uh, that we've done before. Uh, and that doesn't look like it's, it's especially right now with all the cases uh, you know, and hospitalizations rising, for the next several months, everything's gonna be virtual for the most part, as far as what we're recommending people do. So that makes it easier for folks to adopt a district uh, and to host some of these virtual um, events like district organizing meetings and um, uh, what do you call it? Virtual uh, text bank parties and later virtual phone banks. Um, so I'm not sure about the auditing, Cheng Sim. Uh, email us and we'll let you know. I, I, uh, we might be open to it. It sounds like something reasonable if there's people that wanna take part in those trainings. But definitely if you're willing to adopt a district, we, we are looking for people to do that. Okay, so for the people who are not going to adopt like on a case by case basis, you guys can examine their request. Is that something possibly. you're going to do? Yeah, possibly. We haven't discussed it yet, but I'll bring it back to the team and, and we'll see. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so my comment is this, it's, um, I don't know, you know, how, useful it is in terms of the organizing, but 
you know, um, one of the things, um, uh, uh, you know, I've encountered and other people who I'm working with on the resolutions campaign have encountered is that um, people, you know, uh, like you said, you know, uh, uh, California, Bernie won the primary in California. There's, you know, a lot of support for single payer, et cetera. And we're encountering that, um, that, you know, people uh, support single payer, but they don't, they don't know about AB 1400. That's what we're finding out, like, uh, just in terms of our interactions, like, you say, yeah, you know, do you support single payer? Yes, absolutely. Do you know that, you know, we have Bill AB 1400? No, they don't know. So that's the gap that we're trying to fill. And, um, but at the same time, AB 1400 is more than any other single payer bill that's come along. Um, if you, I mean, you know, I'm sure you agree. If you look at the provisions, it's the best single payer bill California's ever had, right? Because all the other previous single payer bills in California have included the ASO, HMO, um, Kaiser Insurance loophole. And AB 1400 removes that loophole. So it's the first California single payer bill to, to be truly single payer and not, you know, multi payer masquerading a single payer, which, you know, all the previous single payer bills were. Um, so it's in that, in, in my view, that's, you know, um, makes it uh, very, very uh, singular. It's, it's the best. Um, um, and we know, I mean, recently there's this case, you know, apart from the issue of like preserving tiered care, have you had, you know, a ASO, you know, HMO kind of uh, uh, carve out uh, in a single payer, uh, you know, you may have seen the previous, uh, in, in the last week or so, is an LA Times article about tens of billions of dollars of fraud that the federal government is alleging and have sued Kaiser and uh, United and uh, Anthem and a bunch of other, uh, you know, insurance companies and hospital associations um, for fraud that they perpetrated using, um, uh, you know, under that the capitation system, uh, that is the payment system under uh, HMO, ASO um, uh, system. So, so there's, you know, potential fraud uh, if, if we were to preserve that, um, you know, ASO, HMO uh, carve out. So that's why AB 1400 is so amazing because it's the first time, you know, we won't face that problem in California uh, if we have AB 1400. Um, the so second one, the second reason why I think AB 1400 uh, is the best single payer bill in California history uh, is is uh, are the provisions that actually improve on even uh, the gold standard nationally, which is usually considered to be Jaya Powell's HR 1976 like uh, Medicare for All bill, um, and that is the, and those are the provisions in AB 1400 that specify um, multilingual, culturally competent care, which is so important in California because we have a sizable immigrant community and you know there are lots of people especially elders who don't speak English as their primary language and it's so important that we have a blueprint for healthcare equality that takes that into account. Um, so those two things uh, uh, apart from the, you know, the global budgeting uh, which allows the assessment of which areas are so, uh, yeah. Sim, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm backing up on questions. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. No, I just want to mention, like, those are the two things that make AB 1400 really singular, like the best single payer bill California's ever had. And I wonder if we can emphasize that more uh, in the messaging um, when we're talking to people about AB 1400. It's not just any old single payer bill, like, you know, uh, from the past. 
Yeah, that's uh, you bring up some really great points about the bill, um, which you're right. It's the the gold standard of single payer uh, health guaranteed health care bills, we believe. And major props to uh, Commissioner Carmen Comstey, who's a lead regulatory specialist for the California Nurses Association, for drafting a lot of that legislation, working with Colorado's office. Uh, and basically, like you said, it was an updated, fleshed out, fleshed out version of SB 562, the previous bill, but with inserting a lot of the great ideas from 1384, 1976, the federal bill, which Carmen also had a hand in, in creating. So, uh, and in particular, those two principles of, of the seven CalCare principles, freedom to choose your provider and patient care based on patient need were really written into the bill to make sure that, um, that there's no um, uh, sort of providers that are also insurance companies that have an incentive to deny care. So we they made a lot of care in making sure that um, uh, you know we didn't allow any sort of payment schemes that would give the provider an incentive to deny care. We want everyone to be able to get the care they need based on medical need, not based on the profits of an insurance company. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, so you brought up a lot of good points there. Oh, as far as education, um, we are offering these CalCare 101 webinars um, on a monthly basis. So if you go to the CalCare handout, you can sign up for those. They're at the top. And feel free to invite anybody who wants to get a little bit slightly deeper, um, you know, a uh, bit of knowledge about the bill. That's the, the purpose of those, to, to talk about uh, the different policy planks there and, and talk about uh, what's so great. You know, two other things I'll just mention really quickly about the bill that uh, I feel like are underappreciated. One, there's a special projects budget written into both uh, CalCare and the federal 1976 bill that's specifically for the construction, renovation, staffing of healthcare facilities in uh, rural and underserved and medically medically underserved uh, communities. So that's huge. The, the government would have the ability to assess like, hey, these areas don't have enough healthcare facilities because hospitals have been closing over the last couple of decades as the industry has become more corporatized. Um, and the CalCare system would be able to go in and say, we need to construct healthcare facilities here and presumably those would either be nonprofits or through the, through the county governments um, to create those. Uh, the, the other thing I'll mention is that there is, this is also both for CalCare and the, um, the federal bill, um, there is a prohibition on what the payments from the CalCare system can be used for. Uh, so it's uh, payments from the CalCare system to hospitals cannot be used for the profit of those hospitals. So in, a, in essence, it removes the profit motive from these hospitals, um, and they would be funded by global budgeting, as Chengson mentioned. So annually, these uh, facilities would meet with the CalCare system and decide what are your needs for the coming year. They would meet on a quarterly basis, and they would be funded for what they need, uh, similar to how fire departments are, are funded. So it would remove the profit motive and make sure that um, doctors and nurses can do their jobs and not have to worry about uh, the profit motive. Awesome, thank you so much, Bill. And thank you, Chang Sim, for that information. It's really important um, you know, that people understand that because that we just have to address all the weak points, every every loophole, every every out that a person or legislator may have um, for not supporting AB 1400. I think it is good to have a talking point to answer that um, because they're going to give every right now. The biggest one is where's the financing. But, you know, we know that that's weak sauce. But um, anyway, I'm going to go because I know I did get backed up. I just want to acknowledge a couple comments, um, one from. Robert Copeland from Facebook, he was just saying the, self, the health ins uh, insurance providers can deny your medication um, as well, at least they, um, they do when you have Medi-Cal, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, they can deny certain medications, especially high cost medications, clinical trials, things like that, um, which is unfortunate. And like I said, that's the importance of CalCare, it does address uh, prescription drugs. Um, and it gives us bargaining power. Um, that's what Medicare uses. They can get their, their prescription drug prices a, a little bit lower, not quite Canadian prices, but lower um, because they have huge bargaining power. With CalCare, it's just, it's collective bargaining. It's, it's like a union. Uh, you know, we have some collective bargaining strength there. We can, you know, get lower medication rates, um, which is very important. Um, 
and hopefully send a little bit of a message to big pharma that we are not just going to let the, you know, you guys name your price on our life-saving medications. Um, so, you know, then another, just really quick going to Keith McCall and he asked any call for fixing the fine, um, fixing the financial financing, I'm sorry, of the healthcare system, be it the state call or national, um, is a very good call. So actually that was more of a comment. Thank you, Keith. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, any, any way of fixing it, whether it be national or state is that it, it's, it is what it is. I think that we have a very strong, um, we have a very strong chance here in California. Um, granted, the nationals working on the same thing, but I think that with the nation being the way that it is and our, our electoral politics being the way that it is, I think that our chances here in California could be a lot higher than the national as long as, you know, we, our assembly people believe in us just like we, you know, will believe in them to pass this, then we can set forth a major rolling stone for, um, you know, the rest of the nation, we will be the Saskatchewan, just like in Canada, which is cool. We would be in history books as the first ones. That would be awesome. Um, and then going to Erica, uh, Erica, you've had your hand up. Thank you so much for waiting. No problem. Um, I just, to Cheng Sen's first question about being able to audit, um, even though you don't have a district, um, I just want to say that that's something that we might be able to provide at HCA LA. Um, you know, Gina is district leader for 54, but she's, she's also um, the lead on districts for us, HCLA. So we can invite any volunteers, whether you have a district or don't have a district, um, we can put on, uh, you know, Gina can redo the CNA thing for all of us and y'all are welcome to come in and listen and learn. And um, that will also help in um, Cheng Sim. I know you've talked about supplemental stuff like tabling, um, doing stuff like that out there. So just, um, you know, contact us, let us know and um, we'll, we'll hold that. So I just wanted to say that. Um, on, on that. So thank you. Thank you, Erica. Yeah, I mean, when we do text banks, I mean, like I said, we're going to be kind of like just a megaphone, which Erica loves her megaphones, uh, for CNA and the strategy. So when we do text banks, you know, Healthcare for All will be, you know, giving um, efforts and time to that, helping district leaders, I think, you know, across LA County, um, you know, if they reaching out to using our, our, our strategies and our um, access and promoting um, to get these text banks and things going because we do need definitely that support as much as possible getting the word out there about AB 1400 and getting people involved in the legislative process because what we know is that democracy only works when you participate in it and participating means calling your legislators and asking them to support AB 1400. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, I don't see any more questions. Do you see anything in the chat and on Facebook, Paul? I'm um, just scanning through, just making sure I don't know where my glasses are, but they're somewhere. I just want to make sure I didn't skip over something. Just basically uh, a couple of comments, but other than that, there haven't been any questions yet. All right. Uh, anybody here in the Zoom have any questions for uh, Phil, Commander, Commando Kim? All right, we got Dr. Bill. Um, I, th I thought, I think it was, uh, was it Rich Wynn brought up uh, uh, the lack of attention in mainstream media? Uh, to oh, thank you so much for that. Yeah, and and I know uh, CNA is a political powerhouse too, and so having having Phil on, you guys are tremendous organizers, but you're also a tremendous, um, uh, you know, tremendously politically savvy and um, and involved a whole lot in um, you know endorsing candidates across the state and uh, and across the country, even through National Nurses United. So, um, so, so what is, uh, what does CNA see as the problem, you know, with corporate media and, um, you know, and, and raising awareness more generally, rather than just uh, say, say, you know, specific strategy as regards um, districts and things, how, how can we help raise awareness that then pushes this into the media and pushes it into the 
minds of uh, politicians too. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Bill. Good question. Um, I don't know if CNA has like an official position on the topic you just raised, but I can give some ideas, and I'm sure all of us have ideas on this. Um, but you're right, it's a huge problem, the fact that uh, the corporate media, the, the mainstream media, uh, is not covering this. You're right. I have, I've barely seen it covered. When we did a lot of the uh, car-based events, people were able to get like local news coverage, but by and large, uh, it's not an issue that's covered, largely ignored or dismissed. Uh, or said that it's, you know, some of the newspapers, their editorial pages have said it's unrealistic. Um, so, uh, you know, there's little practical things we can do, like writing letters to the editor. Shout out to the, um, the North State Medicare for All group up there in Chico, Ute County, has written like an op-ed, or not an op-ed, a, a letter to the editor. Uh, seems like every week I'm, I'm seeing something published about either CalCare or Medicare for All. So that's something concrete you can do. Um, I think uh, the other thing is what you guys are doing right here with social media. Uh, we have an opportunity to, to uh, make use of these tools um, to spread the word. And maybe if there's somebody who's uh, more TikTok savvy, you know, that's something that we can uh, work in there. I don't have a TikTok account myself, but it's you on my to-do list. Who is the most TikTok savvy? Our lovely author himself, Ashkara, is a TikTok person. So um, I have TikTok and I, I don't even think I've posted once on it, but I found out he is a TikTok person. So, uh, you know, if you are on TikTok, please find uh, assembly member Ash Kalra, um, K-L, excuse me, K-A-L-R-A and follow him and also share his TikToks um, because I did not know he and his staff are doing TikToks. Um, so that's pretty awesome. And, uh, and Maureen, you wanted to also speak on this, the media thing. Yes, yes. Um, I think one of the ways to engage the mainstream media is to invite their columnists to a panel. Um, in LA, for instance, we have both Hiltzik and Lazarus who write repeatedly about the problems with the system and they hint around that we need a single payer, we need a universal. So. The, I, I think what you do is you invite them and you, you have a panel of media people and you invite them all to speak. And if CNA was going to do it, you get people from, you know, the SAC B, you get people from San Francisco, whatever it's Chronicle. I'm not sure if it's Gate or wherever, but the big one is up there. You get the San Diego Union Tribune, you get the LA Times and you put a panel together and um, that will get you some coverage. And when you have events, you invite them to speak and that will get you some coverage because they will showcase their own columnists. I yeah, think, that's <laughs> I think, I not would, a, yes. <laughs> not a bad idea. Um, we don't have any immediate plans of doing anything like that, but there's certainly nothing stopping other organizations from, from doing that. Um, I guess. <laughs> Put that hand yeah. loud and clear, got it. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bill? Well, I'm gonna chime in on maybe answering my own question too. <laughs> I, at the same time, want to compliment a uh, huge uh, compliment to Cheng Sim and the work that she's done with uh, L.A., you know, especially on the resolution for Los Angeles, uh, Medicare for All resolutions. And, uh, and I think those uh, resolutions at the city council, counties, you know, board of supervisors, school districts are doing the same thing, too. Right. So they're raising awareness at the local level that's then going to spill over, you know, into the state and national level too. So, um, so that, I, I think that's a tremendous contribution too. I, I do want to say, I mean, this is, we could spend a whole couple hours talking about this issue alone. This is a larger societal problem where, you know, the number of journalists, if you look at a graph of, of the last just like 10, 20 years, we have far fewer journalists working in general. And, most people don't seem to, uh, newspaper, you know, newspapers, especially local newspapers, are shutting down and closing. So this is uh, just a major societal problem that we need to figure out, have some way of having more uh, journalism and, uh, and more, uh, you know, I don't know if it's that, some, some form of nonprofit or government funded uh, media, I think ultimately might be part of the solution. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we definitely do need, I mean, 
we need more integrity in journalism, <laughs> honestly. Uh, okay, I, then um, Dr. Bill and then Maureen. Uh, yes, there, there it is, the fairness doctrine. Thank you. I literally was like, boop, blank space. Um, well, so Dr. Bill, then we'll go to Maureen. Well, real real quick, back to Phil again. Um, I'm wondering if CNA has been working with, um, with Mayor Robert Garcia of uh, Long Beach and uh, the, the mayors for Medicare for All, too, that whole movement, because, uh, again, another great way to move the issue locally, then, you know, moves it up the food chain. Yeah, he, um, a number of the mayors have uh, expressed their strong support for this. Actually, yeah, most of the, uh, if you look at that website, Mayors for Medicare for All, by the way, if you're a mayor and you're watching this, you can sign up on Mayors for Medicare for All. It's funny, that's what their form is geared towards for mayors. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, you know, maybe we'll explore uh, working more closely with them. Good idea. Thanks, Dr. Bill. Maureen? Oh, never mind. Off stack. Yeah, it was the, the fairness doctrine. I was just oh. saying that you know, the, the fairness doctrine. And, and also a problem with the media is not just fewer journalists, but maybe um, this results from fewer journalists. And this I was aware of back in the 1980s, actually, um, late 80s, was that um, a big problem is news sources all reporting from one source. And when, then when one source has misinformation, you will see it in every media medium across the board the same wrong thing. And I found this out in an interesting way. We were at City Hall uh, on an issue and we had yellow signs, yellow signs. Every single newspaper, every single news station said we had pink signs. And I thought, wow, they all got it wrong. That was kind of strange and they all got it wrong in exactly the same way. So that was a big clue to me that one source reported and they all picked it up and megaphoned it. So that's a, a huge problem because it's not even just that we don't have enough journalists, but we have reporting that's really coming from one source, but sort of masquerading as coming from a variety of sources. And that is, is a huge problem for democracy and a huge problem for anything that the people need um, to have passed, you know, for, for, our, for our own um, safety and for the just, you know, justice of a society. It's very problematic. And that's why you invite the journalists to come onto a panel and talk. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's actually something that I think we should talk about, um, you know, and even if it's, you know, healthcare for all or whoever decides to sponsor it, a co-sponsor, I don't know, but I think it is a good idea. Um, just pulling some stuff from Facebook really quick. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I saw, you know, Rich Wynn, or excuse me, um, no, uh, Robert Copeland, you know, it mentioned like, you know, independent news stations like Status Quo, um, you know, is one of our, you know, progressive uh, news outlets um, and um, are talking about Medicare for All, which a lot of uh, progressive ones are. Uh, but getting it out there to the mainstream, like getting it on, let's say, you know, uh, KTLA or something is what, you know, the, what we're wondering is like, you know, why is that? Um, they, all these news stations have health segments, you see them, and none of them have talked about really coverage as much as they like to talk about this, you know, other stuff. Um, but then going on to, uh, Rich, Dr. Wynn, um, he asked, he's asking, have there been any thoughts uh, to starting a statewide ad campaign? Um, if that's for me, uh, we don't have any plans uh, for that at the moment, but uh, um, down the road, you know, uh, we'll see. The closer we get to winning, you know, ultimately there's going to be a lot of um, uh, ads and there's going to be more sort of uh, the, the opposition will be more, more vocal is what I'm trying to say as we get closer to winning. Um, and w uh, down the road, all, there's also the idea that say we are successful and we pass the bill and the governor signs it. Uh, there's also the possibility down the road that the, um, the industry will try to get it on the ballot, in which case we'll definitely see lots of um, ads against it and we'll have to raise money for it. And that'll be part of it. But at this point, we're not, um, not quite there yet. One other um, idea I wanted to add here, this is just about the general sort of um, organizing strategy and the media, uh, some comments on that. Um, there's a book, I always bring this up and I was talking to Keith actually uh, about this earlier. Um, 
Um, but the book, This is an Uprising, uh, sort of lays out, by Mark and Paul Engler, lays out two schools of organizing. So there's the more sort of traditional um, structure-based organizing that a lot of unions and community organizations do. It's focused on one-on-one -on -one sort of conversations and slowly like growing. It's what you more traditionally think of as organizing, like finding, recruiting, de developing leaders. It can take a lot of work, a lot of conversations, a lot of door knocking. Um, and that works. It's just a slower and steady form of organizing. But then you also have these uh, pivotal moments in history, these moments of the whirlwind, uh, where suddenly lots of people want to get involved in an issue and the media covers something. Oftentimes there's a trigger event that causes um, that to happen, where lots of people suddenly get involved in an issue and then there's an uprising. Uh, and so I'm sure we can all think of examples of this, like the, the brutal police murder of George Floyd sparked uh, the largest social movement in U.S. history with all the Black Lives Matter protests. And so there is a question of, can we strategically plan something like that for this issue, for healthcare, for CalCare, for Medicare for all? I don't have an answer for that, but there's a whole uh, school of organizers that try to do a hybrid from a form of organizing and it's uh, Momentum Community. If you look that up, they have a whole training institute and they're the group that helped form Sunrise Movement, if not now, and a whole bunch of organizations. And that's something actually that I haven't seen yet in the healthcare uh, organizing realm, like a group of people committed to that type of momentum organizing, as they call it. Yeah, that's interesting, um, you know, point to bring up is that, yeah, I, and I don't know if it's because it's such a huge thing we're tackling here. Um, this was brought up in a previous conversation. I think Erica was there too, where we were asking a similar conversation about, you know, like the George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter um, movement, you know, had a large response, but healthcare, you know, the healthcare for all and things like that, it's not similar. But I'm like, unfortunately, you know, the tragedies that occurred, you know, that was a, a, a very violent moment watching someone be murdered by people that are there to protect you. And while we know every single day people are dying due to poor insurance, underinsured, no insurance, it's, it just doesn't light like that, that instance does. And that's why you don't see that huge like powder keg, you know, explosion response. It's, it's, and unfortunately it's just, that's kind of the truth of it. But I do believe that there are going to be more um, responses that are getting, you know, from the public because of COVID um, and, and just the, especially when now premiums, the insurance companies are salivating on increasing premiums due to cost. And so, and the next year or two, um, those of us who actually are insured will start seeing our premiums go up. Um, because of this, and it's not because the insurance companies are going broke. Um, so really quick, I want to go to Al and the Facebook uh, universe, which I lost it. Um, okay, uh, found it again. Well, I thought I did. Nope, 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 sorry. Uh, Facebook universe. Where'd it go? Oh, he says, how are we fighting for this with the recall in play? Which is a good question. This actually was a comment that came up. I think Randy had brought a very similar comment about the recall. We know, I hate that the recall is going on right now because it's very distracting from the issue, but it is something that we have to address. So how are you guys thinking about that or addressing that with CNA? Yeah, that's a good question. I think we're treating uh, the two issues separately. So we're against the recall. We, we can't have a far right, you know, uh, Republican in office. And that's the real danger here. Uh, if people uh, vote for the recall and, and Newsom's recalled, the, the front runners on question two are all these, uh, you know, uh, right wingers with extreme Republican politics. Um, and so, um, that's the reality. We, we have to stop that and we have to vote no on question one. And then it's up to people however they want to vote on question two. But those ballots are going out. Actually, in some counties, they're already out. Uh, and then for the rest of the counties, they're mailing out, I think, on uh, uh, next, uh, not this coming Monday, but next Monday. But we're going to be, um, you know, we're going to be campaigning uh, against the recall, urging people to vote no on the recall. Uh, but the reality is because it's so immediate, um, you know, we are keeping, we, we're treating it separately from CalCare. So we're going to defeat the recall and then we have a, a whole, you know, CalCare program that I just mentioned as far as organizing over the next five months. Um, that's, that's what we're doing. Thanks, Phil. Um, Nancy, you had a question? 
Really, it's a well. I do have a question. I and a comment. Um, I wasn't clear. Are all physicians? It's always saying all. You can pick your physician. Well, that's been said about a lot of things. And are physicians mandated to take part in this? Um, no, but if they want to, um, I mean, the uh, the other option to get reimbursed for them would be by cash. Um, so, but, you know, from patients. So if there's, you know, a bunch of wealthy patients that want to just pay cash and not be part of this CalCare system, then there could conceivably be some doctors that just take uh, cash and operate like that. But um, what the what CalCare does do, and same thing with Medicare for All, is that it prohibits duplicative coverage. Um, so that means that this would be the only um, insurance for all these services provided for uh, what's covered, all medically necessary services, medical, dental, vision, uh, reproductive care, uh, long-term care. Um, so for a doctor to take part in this system, then yeah, they have to um, you know, uh, be able to see any patient that wants to, wants to see them. Um, but like I said, conceivably, there could be um, people that don't want to be part of the system and just take uh, really well-off billionaire, you know, uh, customer, you know, clients, patients rather. Um, and uh, maybe there's a market for that. I don't know. Oh, there's a big market. But, but what's to stop a parallel insurance company? Oh, so, go ahead. It Sorry, yeah, just it prohibits an insurance company from covering the same same benefits that are offered. It prohibits duplicative coverage. So it would not allow those insurance companies to exist. For things that are not covered by CalCare, which is hardly anything, but conceivably non-necessary cosmetic you know, surgery, there could be an insurance company that offered, that covered those benefits. Um, but if it but basically any insurance company would not be allowed to cover for the same benefits covered by CalCare. I hope that made sense. Yes, that's where I, I always like to add that's the, if people wanna have a buy-up plan, because other countries do have that, they have a public and system and then they have, you can have buy-up plans, you know, you can have an additional supplemental. I mean, Medicare has that now, supplementals. Um, so as long as they don't cover what CalCare covers, like the insurance plan couldn't cover primary care visits because CalCare is gonna cover primary care visits. And if we're paying for it already, then an insurance company that's double that's kind of like double dipping on the on the the uh, the citizen um you know they have to pay the insurance company and they're paying the state you know you know if they're paying through it for it through their taxes or however um you know to have um you know, uh, insurance coverage. So we can't double dip. And as far, I believe as, as far as I know, if they opt out of CalCare, they're opted out for two years. So if the providers, um, if the providers say, you know what, let's say CalCare passes, we got it all good, we got it approved, and now we're rolling out. And they say, um, no, I don't want to be part of this. Let's say, you know, it is a high-end um, physician's office and they don't want to be part of it. Well, guess what? if they uh, decide six months that they see how, how effective it is and then they see that their, their office is hurting because a lot of their patients went under CalCare, they have to wait out two years um, before they can join back in. So, um, so that's, the, that's one of the things. It's kind of like, you know, like with Medicare, like it was like join it or don't, but if you don't, you might notice it might hit your pocketbook pretty hard. Um, so yeah, just going back really quick, um, to a question from Robert Coplin and Facebook land, um, would the COVID-19 pandemic be a trigger event for CalCare or Medicare for all? Personally, I think so. Phil, what do you think? Um, that's a great question. And actually it's an, uh, the topic of an article, uh, by Mark and Paul Engler who wrote the book on this topic. Uh, so if you Google COVID-19 trigger event, Mark and Paul Engler, or sorry, I think it's Paul Engler who wrote it. Um, he raises this question. It was earlier in the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, I, you know, it hasn't really happened that way. And it's kind of crazy that it hasn't when you think about it, because how many people have died and directly been affected by our broken healthcare system related to COVID? You know, how many people, even with the vaccine, you know, people are so ingrained with this idea that healthcare costs so much money, polls have shown that there's a significant percentage of people uh, who are not getting the vaccine because they don't know that it's completely free. 
Um, it's a small percentage, but it, it's still a percentage. Um, so uh, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. Why didn't it cause a trigger event on this issue and a lot of issues? Um, I think hopefully in, in, in people's, uh, in the public consciousness, people are more aware of why this is so important, but for whatever reason, we haven't had people taking to the streets uh, demanding this. Uh, not that we should necessarily do that now because of Delta variant, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, Nancy, did you have a response to that? Um, no, no, but I did want to make a comment um, that I've said before. I, but I think it answers the previous uh, discussion. Why isn't this making the public media? And I think because the message is too complicated and it really drives me nuts when someone, when someone not in the movement poses the question, well, how much is it gonna cost? The knee jerk answer should be it's cheaper. And all of us don't do that. It makes me crazy that that simple message isn't out there. And I really think that's what the media needs to be doing. It's all the care for less. And if we could get that one line into the consciousness, then you've got your foot in the door and you can explain all these important details. I, I, I agree. I think that that simple messaging is so important. I try to lead with that. Unfortunately, they have put so much negative, like, oh, it costs so much that when I say it's cheaper, people want almost like a budget ledger. They want me to go dollar for dollar how it's cheaper. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Nobody asks this about the military budget. You don't want you. Nobody looks at the Congressional Budget Office budgets and asks how it is dollar for dollar. But for some reason, when it comes to this healthcare discussion, and it always it goes to that, you know, how and show me and evident and I'm just like nobody asked for evidence for anything else anyway uh, I'm sorry I, I digress uh, Maureen you want to respond and yes. then we'll go to James yes, I do. Uh, I think Nancy's exactly right but we also can very succinctly say that there have been um, 22 studies in 17 years in this country in every single study even the conservative Mercatus Institute shows significant savings. We can also look, there's a very nifty little graph. I think it's from um, the OCED. Um, and uh, it, it shows that it's just a bar graph. United States pays $11,000 per capita, doesn't cover everybody. 7,000 of that is public money. 4,000 is out of pocket. Then it's got an average of the 35 uh, OCED countries and they pay total less than 5,000. And sometimes it'll be 4,000 public money and a thousand out of pocket, like for a couple of countries, I think Germany and I don't know who else, but somebody else, but most countries like Spain and Italy, it's all public money. So when you look at this bar graph and you see that we're paying 7,000 public money and 4,000 out of pocket on top of it, and they're paying 5,000, between four and 5,000 period, that tells us all we need to know. And the fact that we are ranked 47th in the world for outcomes and the fact that we are ranked number one in preventable death and number one in preventable disability and number one in what we pay for pharmaceuticals. So, you know, a simple bar graph like that. And yes, Nancy, we have to say it's cheaper. 22 studies in 17 years say that. And here's look at the international experience we are paying you know, two and a half times what anybody else pays and we don't even cover everybody. So, yeah. And I, that, mean, the simple, that. I think the simple answer is it's cheaper and 30% of every one of our healthcare dollars goes to overhead. And I think that's a one liner. Yeah. I mean, point blank period. I like simplicity and I think the rest of America needs simplicity. Yeah. Um, so really quick, I wanna go to James uh, who uh, put in a, a, a question from Facebook and, and he says, can we have a neutralizing campaign for the medical industrial complex rate truthfulness of a statement from true to pants on fire? I like, I like that. I would love to see a pants on fire, like lots of little fire emojis on that. 
Yeah, that's a, a Brazilian butt lift. I'm sorry. <laughs> Pants are on fire. Would that be covered? I don't know. <laughs> I don't even. Is that a real thing? I've never even heard of that. A Brazilian uh, butt lift. Yeah, is it's, a cos- really yeah, it's a cosmetic about. procedure. I refer to it several times during office hours because um, when I talk about things that are not covered, um, you know, the elective cosmetic procedures, Brazilian butt lifts are, you know, one of them. And so I use that as just like my like one of my extreme like no your Brazilian butt lift won't be covered because there's no real medical necessity for a Brazilian butt lift unless like a bear ripped off your butt cheek or something um, which is very very rare but if that is a medical necessity just like um, for example breast cancer patients breast cancer patients can't have breast augmentation done when they you know unfortunately have to have mastectomies um, due to the breast cancer and so breast augmentation comes with that and is covered under insurance Um, but you know that is a medical necessity. Um, and so, you know, that's where I, that comes in. So yes, it is a proceed. It's something, it just, it's a running joke with me. Google okay. it, Phil Kim, Google it. <laughs> good to know, good to know. I will. Um, <laughs> I'd like to make a claim that it's necessary. Yep. <laughs> it's medically necessary. Don't just get the text, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, I, can I add to the rather frivolous notion that you know that that the only example people can come up with is cosmetic plastic surgery because the notion of universal single payer uh universal health care um is so comprehensive people can't come up with an with with a, an uncovered benefit every essential medical service is covered and everybody is so-called cadillac plan does not cover everything. So, you know, I reject that offhand. People say, I have great insurance. No, you don't. No, you don't. Check the fine print. You do not have uh, the kind of coverage that CalCare has, that SB 562 had, you know, and that um, that HR 1976 has. It just can't be done by commercial insurance. So I, I challenge anyone to come up with any other, you know, uncovered benefit um, that is essential medical service. It, I don't think we, I don't think you can find anything else. We make jokes about that, but it's true. There is nothing else that people can come up. with. It is very true. That's the reason why I say this is like the platinum package of Medicare for all, because even the things that um, are not covered under Medicare, like long term care, um, which is not a Medicare covered benefit, it is covered under Medi-Cal, but not Medicare um, is covered under AB 1400, which is very important as we are aging. It's very important depending on, you know, certain communities. I know our, you know, Asian Pacific Islander communities, um, really long term care is very important to them. I've talked to several people um, who are very concerned about long term care for their seniors. Um, and that is something that they don't have that they are struggling uh, to pay for. So it's really, like I said, Medicare platinum package. I just want to go to Chang Sim really quick. She's been putting stack in the chat. I'm sorry, Chang Sim. I can't see it all the time. So um, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to what people were discussing earlier, what Nancy said, Maureen and um, other people about, uh, you know, finding something very uh, concise and clear, easy to understand some, you know, soundbite kind of uh, fact, factoid. Um, and I think that's important and all that. But I also wanted to say, want to, you know, say again, that the fight we're having is not that, you know, um, single payer um, doesn't save money all that. We, we, we've, we've won that argument, you know, I mean, Maureen's, I mean, like study upon study, there's just this, you know, so, I, th- I mean, the fight is a, a political fight, uh, regardless of all the, 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 the um, benefits, right? The savings, lives saved, suffering, you know, diminished, um, budget saved for uh, our municipalities and uh, governments. Despite all of these established uh, benefits to single payer over the current system, what blocking it is not that we haven't made the case for 
you know, that single payer is going to improve, um, you know, what we're all currently facing. The problem is the political will not, <laughs> not to achieve, not to have single payer. It's a political fight we're facing um, more than any other fight. And I think, you know, um, I think we know that, but I, you know, I just want to bring, bring that back up. It's, you know, what happened with SB 562, you know, took, took a speaker, one person to block, <laughs> to block it, the block bill from advancing. So, um, you know, like it or not, we have to, to grapple with it as a political fight. And, you know, uh, and how do we do it? We have to bring our numbers up to a degree where the politicians recognize that um, they, you know, refuse to support AB 1400 at their peril. Um, that's our only path forward. And so I just want to say, you know, we just need to recognize and keep our eyes on the prize that this is a political fight more than anything else. Thank you. Yeah, if, if I could comment, uh, you know, Cheng Sim, I think you're exactly right. And it's it's about organizing. You know, um, when we're trying to get the legislators uh, and other government officials on board, um, I kind of compare it to uh, union negotiations. So it's not, when you're at the bargaining table, it's not necessarily about the specific arguments you're making to the boss, um, though sometimes that helps. Uh, it's not about, uh, you know, how you talk about it. It's, it's about the power that you have. Uh, and it's not even necessarily what happens in that negotiation room. It's about the power that you're showing on the shop floor. So kind of the equivalent of that on the state level would be, it's not about that in that lobby visit, having the perfect argument and the perfect piece of uh, perfect study showing the legislator, this makes sense. This is a, a good idea. It's about having the political power in the district, having a base of supporters that you can show to the boss, show to the legislator uh, that people are demanding this. So that's um, uh, exactly right. It's about organizing. It's about power. It's about convincing more of the public to take action, because I think we do have a majority of the public with us on this issue. Uh, and that's one final plug I'll make for the uh, district leaders program um, is that you know, these are state level uh, legislators that we're reaching out to. So even though this is um, the largest state, fifth largest economy in the country, um, we have an opportunity because um, uh, most people don't actually know who their state legislator is. If you asked me like five years ago, I wouldn't have known who my state legislator was. And so what that means is there's relatively low participation and engagement with these officials. So that means if we are able to, in our districts, get a committed group of people to build support, we can actually influence them. You know, and I know a lot of us here have been involved in a local Democratic Party politics as well. And we see some of these people and we're starting to see uh, some of our peers rise up to the position of being able to run for these positions. But if, if you have like a committed group of people, even if you're a small group, you can build enough support to actually influence these legislators. So I, I think it's actually easier to influence state legislators than it is say a US Senator, for example. Absolutely. So again, we need some CalCare district leaders to get, that, uh, get those efforts going. Uh, please sign up at, at the uh, CalCare handout. Absolutely. Um, yes, it's very important. I see the stack, but really quick, you brought up something that we have been having off and on discussions. It's been the off and on reason why um, certain groups, certain coalitions, any, you know, they like people are hesitant about jumping on AB 1400 because they're concerned about unions. And so in my, my opinion, I would think that this should be a no brainer for a union because this means it takes away part of the conversation, meaning you don't have to spend so much time talking about healthcare benefits and everything. Um, you can go on to maybe, you know, fighting for safety or some other, some other issue because you don't have to spend so much of your, your bargaining power on healthcare. But, um, you know, what is your take or what is CNA's take on that whole, that whole argument right there is that, you know, we can't support AB 1400 because of the union. Yeah, that's a good question. Also, sometimes a tricky question, because um, and every union's different, by the way, and has a slightly different position, slightly different structure. Um, so first, I'll say that both Medicare for all and CalCare 
officially on paper have the support of the labor movement. So um, a majority of uh, unions representing a majority of um, union members have, have endorsed uh, Pramila Jayapal's bill, HR 1976. And here in California, we do have the official support of the California Labor Federation. Uh, a few months back, it was one of the priority bills. Um, that said, you know, different unions are, I'd say that, I mean, you're right that a majority of unions are not, this is not their top issue, you know, and a, a handful of unions are even opposed to it because I think of a, a misunderstanding of how this would affect their hard fought union benefits. And some, some unions do have uh, what are called Taft-Hartley funds, which are basically insurance companies they administer with um, with the um, employers. They have these joint uh, Taft-Hartley funds. And we saw in, for example, Las Vegas, the culinary union, that's probably one of the main reasons why they opposed uh, Bernie Sanders. They were pretty explicit about that. Uh, even though a lot of Unite Here locals here in California uh, have endorsed AB 1400, um, uh, and their industry actually is a perfect example of why we need it, because so many hotel workers, casino workers, hospitality workers were laid off during the pandemic and still a number of them are not working. Um, so um, what we're planning, you know, I don't have, obviously I don't have the, um, the exact answers of how we're gonna go about getting more unions on board, but we're, we're planning some more outreach with the Central Labor Council, some educational materials. Um, and then if people are union members, they can bring it up within their union meetings and union structures to take on a more active position of support for AB 1400. Uh, but that's basically what we're doing for now. Uh, always open to ideas. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's just one of the conversations. Even people have asked me directly and I, I just hit them like very simply keeping it surface level that imagine what your union can do if they didn't have to spend the majority of their time doing their bargaining sessions talking about your health care benefits because you already have health care. So let's talk about safety. Let's talk about, I mean, for the nurses or healthcare workers, let's talk about getting those beds repaired timely or the equipment done, making sure that, you know, hell, let's make sure that the bathroom toilets flush, you know, like that type of stuff that is, it seems that gets always pushed back. That's actually really important. That makes a big difference. Um, you know, it would be able to be pushed up the agenda a little bit. So that's just how I keep it on the surface level when I'm talking to mainly union uh, members, um, not necessarily the leaders, um, but, you know, the members, I tell them like, hey, think about what they could do if they didn't have to spend so much time doing this. So I want to go to the stack. Um, I have Erica up next, then Maureen, and then I have uh, Rich on Facebook. And if, sorry, one, one more thing, I forgot if maybe we, if somebody could share this, do a screen share of this um, one slide, I wanted to add one more piece. Sure, um, I'll just, share it right now. Give okay, and this is just about how expensive employer-sponsored insurance is and how much of a burden it is on workers, especially for, for union workers when you're going to negotiate your contracts. So okay. if you, yeah, if you see the last uh, 20 years, Look how much the premiums for uh, family coverage, employer-sponsored insurance costs. This is crazy. So currently it's over $21,000 that unions are trying to negotiate per worker to cover their, their family coverage. And this is not sustainable. Uh, almost every single uh, labor dispute and strike in, in modern day is, is centered around the cost of healthcare. You know, and we're the only industrialized country that has these union fights, uh, union negotiation fights over over healthcare. So this is, you know, I, I always show this graph about just the sheer cost of insurance, employer contribution on the left side and the worker contribution on the right side. But of course, it's all coming out of the same pot of money. Um, so just imagine if we didn't have to, uh, if union members did not have to fight for that every time you went to go to negotiations. Yeah, and I just want to point out really quick, this is stagger. I mean, literally staggering. It is staggered. But look here in 1999, when Gina was a wee tot, um, you know, cost was $5,791. Let's fast forward 20 years, which I mean, granted, everyone remembers 1999. I do. Um, and I'm sure everyone that's listening in does remember something about 1999, no matter what phase of life you were in at that point. But now look at this gap. Look at this from 5000 almost 6000 to $21,000. What is going on? What is going on that caused this huge jump? I mean, I know we got a little fatter, we got a little sicker, but not that fat, not that sick. So what is going on? 
Um, and I just, this is just staggering. I mean, literally it just mind blown. Where's the mind blown emoji? Pew. Thank you for sharing that, Phil. I really appreciate it. I hope everyone watching really sees this. I just want to emphasize again, 1999, right? Y2K, you know, we're turning off our computers. So the whole thing didn't just fail. Uh, I remember Y2K. And now look how much we've jumped, $5,791 to $21,300. Another, another key date on this graph is 2010, because that's when the Affordable Care Act passed. And as you can see, it did nothing to, to solve this problem. Uh, the, the rate of increase has continued steadily. Uh, and in fact, the Affordable Care Act, this is another underappreciated part of it, uh, bad thing, is that the medical loss ratios, which say that insurance companies have to spend 80 or 85% of, of the, the premiums coming in on healthcare, and I think it was well-intended, that means that insurance companies uh, have an incentive to increase overall healthcare spending because their take of that, that 15% or 20% is limited. And so that means if overall healthcare spending increases, they're able to get a larger part of it. So that's why the insurance companies are fine with increased costs. Yeah, exactly. And thank you for bringing that up. You brought up a very, very good point because people are like, well, look how much the insurance industry is paying. And what you just said is so key. It's like, are they really... Uh, and, you know, that gives them more of an excuse for the to do that administrative overhead that causes that bloat and waste. I know companies that have more VPs than they have toilet paper in the bathrooms. For what reason? I do not know. Um, so uh, thank you so much. Do you uh, still want me to share the slide or are you? Oh, no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. This was a really eye opening slide. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, and then uh, let's see up next we had Maureen on the stack and then we'll go to Rich. I just wanted to pile on top of what um, uh, Phil said, and that was the Milliman report, which is like an actuarial um, international uh, firm that looks at these kinds of numbers that have to do with employment. And uh, this was a, about two years ago, they said the average worker in the US makes $58,000 and the average cost for their family of four is around $24,000. And the Milliman report said that um, <clears throat> the most lucrative kind of um, insurance uh, uh, in terms of profit is employer-sponsored health insurance. And there's one other aspect to that as well. And that is the huge problem with this is that people don't have any choice then. Workers don't have a choice as to who is going to be their healthcare provider. A lot of companies right now, they just say, look, you got Kaiser, that's it. So you're trapped and you know Kaiser knows it. You have no choice, you can't leave because your employer decides who you're going to get your care from. You don't decide. And, um, you know, and, and it also gives the insurance industry, whether it's Kaiser or Anthem or whoever, gives them tremendous power over huge uh, numbers of people at one place of employment. And so it, it's just a terrible system all the way around. I just wanted to say, Jean, in case you didn't see, Sam um, Cozzolino has a question. He hasn't said anything. So and I oh, um, Sure, Sam, go ahead. Uh, and then we'll come back to Rich. Oh yeah, this was just a, a basic question. It was just uh, about, uh, oh yeah, yeah, I think it's being answered. Uh, but yeah, it's just about uh, in terms of calling uh, our legislators, should should we call our senators and our uh, uh, assembly members? And then also, uh, which number should we call Sacramento or uh, the local uh, office? Uh, good questions. Um, you can call um, both your assembly member and state senator, uh, urge them to support AB 1400. If they're a co-author, be sure to thank them for, for co-authoring. Let them know that you're, uh, you're there for them and that you really are happy that they're, they're taking a, a, a leadership position on this. Um, and uh, we're just urging you to always keep a high road approach uh, with these legislators. We don't want to give them any excuse to not support this um, in the last go around, uh, there was, yeah, uh, uh, during the SB 562 fight, they were accusing activists of various things which were not true at all, but we want to make sure we take a high, high road approach and, and so that they don't have any excuse to not uh, work on this. And uh, sorry, and they can call the, I guess the Capitol office, the Sacramento office uh, would be better to call, but really either one is fine. Thanks, Sam. That was a great question. 
Um, and so then we're gonna go to uh, Rich from Facebook. How do we increase our political power? We become billionaires, Rich. That's how we do this. <laughs> Jokes. Um, anyway, and then where are we uh, in gaining um, union support like SEIU, et cetera? How about faith organizations? Seems like good areas to target. Um, well, um, how do we gain political power? Uh, that's uh, that's the question. That's what we're working on. Um, and. And you made a joke, uh, Jedi Gina, about the becoming a billionaire, but that's true. You, there's two roots. It's either money or people, people power. And obviously, it's not a guaranteed thing to become a billionaire. But if you have a good, you know, if you have a good um, invention or something, business idea, go for that and try to be a you can use your use your profits for good if that's possible. But um, otherwise. You know, like the rest of us, we'll have to focus on organizing people, and that involves talking to new people, uh, reaching out to organizations that could potentially be allies. Um, there's uh, this concept of uh, power mapping, which is part of the training we'll be offering the district leaders, uh, but figuring out who are the organizations in your district uh, and how much influence do they have with your legislator and where are they on this issue. And so you can either get some of the uh, organizations uh, to take this on more actively as an issue, uh, or you can, what, if, if your organization is a dedicated single payer group, you can just try to increase the power of your organization by growing your numbers, getting more supporters, getting more people to take part in your actions. Uh, those are basically the, uh, the ways of building power. And of course, there's a lot of different ways of, uh, of doing that can call them, you can uh, reach out to them one by one, you can hold events, um, everything Healthcare for All Los Angeles is doing and more. Thank you. Um, and then really quick, I, I missed this in the chat, I'm sorry, um, but do you know, Erica asked uh, did, if you knew, if, or excuse me, if you know if CTA endorsed AB 1400? Um, I think they might have. If you, if you, Talk amongst yourself for a minute. I can I can look and get back to you in a second. All right, awesome. Um, um they they did. They have it when they list they list the legis, legis, legislation that they support. AB fourteen hundred is there. Somebody oh, sent me, they sent me a screenshot and it was there. Yay! Um, awesome. That is awesome. Um, we definitely want more union support. Like I said, you know. Um, I don't think it for some, I don't think winning over the members is going to be as challenging as winning over the leadership um, with, uh, you know, some of the unions. And I hope that if you are a union leader and you have questions or if you want to engage in discussion, I just want to open this door to office hours for you. Um, feel free to join us. It's, and I, I really uh, love creating a safe space. Um, you know, even with our core group, we don't always agree on things and that is okay because we always approach it with love and appreciation and respect. Um, so I just want to open up that door um, for any of our union leaders who want to have a good discussion about this bill, um, about how we feel about it. There are several union members that are part of HCA uh, LA that, you know, will definitely give their feedback as well. So I'm always opening the door to our legislators, our union leaders. Um, because I do wholeheartedly support this um, myself. Um, and, and I will say, I do promote, the, I will be promoting this at the bedside. So yes, I will be talking to patients about AB 1400 as I'm telling them what their insurance doesn't cover. And I may or may not tell them who their legislators are to call. So just putting that out there, but it's all love, all love. <laughs> um, and then I just a question I see from Chang Sim just popped up in a chat. Um, does CNA maintain an updated list of uh, organizational endorsers, including unions of AB 1400? Um, we have an internal list that we're keeping, but it, it needs to be updated and it's very incomplete. Um, uh, so uh, we don't really have a publicly available one, uh, but ultimately um, at the, um, oh, I'm glad you're bringing this up actually. Um, so um, for the first uh, hearing uh, in the health committee, uh, any organization and really any individual can submit an official letter of, su of support to the legislature to register their support and they'll be listed on the committee's, um, uh, I think they call them analyses or uh, they're on their official report. Uh, and uh, so that's something that you can do uh, if your organization does support AB 1400, you can submit a official letter of support 
to the legislature using their uh, portal. They, they only accept uh, electronic files, a PDF or a Word file, and you have to use their website to uh, submit it. Or you can mail a physical letter as well, but that's less common. Maybe we should send them thinking of you cards or something. Uh, thinking of you, I think would be good. Thinking of you as you support AB 1400. Um, subliminal love, that's, that's what I call that. Um, and then does anyone else have any questions? I'm sorry, I'm just scanning back through the chat. If, I, if anybody, Paul, if I missed a question, please let me know. Um, can't find my glasses, like I said. Uh, <laughs> So anybody? We still have about 15 minutes. Um, you know, any questions about the bill? I know we've talked a lot about strategy, a lot about, you know, kind of ideas. Um, any questions about the bill, what's in the bill or, um, you know, anything like that? Because like I said, I'm hoping that what you guys are going to do is go back out to your community. And if I just want to drop this too, if you do have community organizations that you want to approach or you're not sure about approaching or you don't feel like you may be the right one to talk about this, let us know. Um, myself or uh, Ron, um, I'm going to volunteer Dr. Bill. <laughs> I mean, we're so many people here that would love to, you know, take time, we could take time to talk to an organization if you have one about this bill. Um, you know, I, you know, I just let us know and we can definitely make it happen. We do definitely want to do outreach more to community organizations like that was asked faith based or faith based organizations like churches, um, especially, you know, churches have a lot of our seniors there um, who are, have been, you know, really cut off due to COVID. So they may not know anything about this going on right now, even though it will be greatly affecting them. Um, so, you know, just let us know. You can drop it in the chat. You can send us a message on Facebook, um, e email, smoke signal. I see smoke signals, you know, whatever. Um, Erica, I saw you just raise your hand. Question for you, Phil. Um, you know, if Governor Newsom used his bully pulpit to demand that his supermajority Democratic legislature get the bill to his desk to sign, I mean, that's that's the one person that we need. I mean, we've seen that, right? So we know that it was Jerry Brown who sent the message down the pike, I don't want SB 562 on my desk. So they fell in line. So, you know, it with Newsom, it would be the same thing, right? I want this on my desk. Um, and they would fall in line. Um, and you would think that with him facing this recall, he would be motivated to do that because um, this is such a popular um, popular thing across the board. So my question is, you know, do you think that we target the governor with that message? and the California you know, legislature or just the California legislature? What are your thoughts? Um, these are good questions. Um, well, as far as the recall goes, you know, as I mentioned early, just, uh, earlier, uh, you know, just because it's so uh, imminent, it's, the ballots are already going out to folks and, and people will start voting very soon. Um, I don't think there's uh, a way to connect that to, uh, to this issue, unfortunately. Right now, it's just a matter of making sure some uh, far-right extreme Republican does not uh, gain control of the largest state government in the country. Um, but uh, as you're certainly right that um, you know uh, the governor did campaign on single-payer guaranteed health care. He made it very explicit. Uh, I think a lot of us were at some of the conventions where he told us this. Um, and told, um, yeah, rooms full of uh, progressives this. Um, right now, we're focused on the legislature, but that certainly doesn't focus, uh, sorry, certainly doesn't stop other people from, from asking him to take a position in support of this. He certainly could. Uh, and actually, uh, shout out to uh, Sean Broadbent. He, he shared an a interesting article recently um, that Bill Moyers wrote a couple years ago about, years, years ago about how Medicare was won. So, um, uh, and there's a couple, um, there's two articles actually. So there's one by Natalie Shore, I think, and she wrote about how the movement won Medicare for all, uh, sorry, Medicare back in 1965. Um, you know, it was a, 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 
years long fight to win it, but seniors, the labor movement, the civil rights movement all united to finally push it through. But the article by Bill Moyers, who worked for the uh, Lyndon Johnson administration at the time, talked about LBJ's efforts internally to push the uh, members of Congress uh, to, to support. So that certain, certainly played a role, it seemed like. Um, so it certainly can't hurt in my mind. But uh, like I said, we're just because of this tight legislative timeline coming up in January, what we're focused on is building support, especially in these 33 priority districts and getting the, the legislature to do the right thing. Thanks, Bill. Um, and then just a comment from Keith Mc, uh, McCollin, um, just AB 1400 and the National Medicare for All Bills are a lifeline for union locals and the union institution. Hashtag yes. Um, because, you know, healthcare, like I said, they don't have to fight for healthcare. They can fight for everything, like a four day work week. Works in Sweden, worked in, I think, Iceland. I'm just saying, there's so many things that we could have. Imagine what, I mean, just, I know how much time unions have to spend fighting for healthcare. And without having to do that, A, union organizers and negotiators may A, feel a little less stress, and then B, uh, four day work week. I mean, I, four days a week, that's awesome. That extra one day, how many of you right now on Sunday are rolling your eyes about it being Monday? What if you had an extra day? Oh, huh. yeah, that's what unions can do for you if they didn't have to fight about healthcare. So let's get AB 1400 done. Yeah, yeah, okay. That would be amazing. Yeah, who wants to be, you know, life is short. Who wants to be just working all the time, you know? Nobody. Um, Nobody. Yeah, we we won the 40 hour work week, a bunch of European countries were able to get to like a 35 and 32 hour work week, or 30 hour work week in some countries. But you know, unfortunately, we've, we've lost power and, and uh, people are working two jobs. Uh, you, you all know this, but uh, ideally, uh, I think it, it would be amazing to fight for a lower work week, a four day work week. Um, and Medicare for all CalCare would be uh, a step in that direction as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, with that, with healthcare, just moving forward as we get into younger generations, you know, unfortunately, because the unions were really took a heavy blow in the 80s and 90s, um, maybe as early as the late 70s, um, generations like mine, the millennials, Gen Z, and the generation, I don't even know the name of it coming after that, um, don't really understand unions. We don't really, we haven't grown up with much union. I mean, maybe our, maybe we'd be are fortunate to have family members, but a lot of us don't know a lot about unions like you would have if you grew up in the early 70s, 60s, 50s, you know, with those strong industrial union jobs. And so with unions, we need to make, have them make a comeback with the new generations. And our generation for sure is big on work-life balance. So I think one thing to, to plug with AB 1400 is that when you don't have to worry so much about your health care um, and then taking, you become a healthier person because you can go to the doctor when you need to, um, emphasis on when you need to. Um, and then, you know, then you live a healthier lifestyle through that you have a better life through that you enjoy your life and we become better society, maybe not so angry, not so hateful, more, more compassion, more empathy. Um, so I think you're describing Canadians. Am I Canadian? Is that what, is this, am I sounding Canadian? <laughs> They're so nice in Canada. And I think it's because they have healthcare and tuition-free university and maybe, living maybe wages. I am from Canada. Well, uh, shout out to, you know, like, I mean, if, if Trudeau wants to adopt me, that's fine. Um, but no, but it, maybe they're on to something with that. Maybe grind culture isn't the way to be. Maybe working 80 hours a week isn't something to be proud of. And maybe it's something to, you know, more so that we should fix. It's a problem we should fix. Being unhealthy is a problem that we should fix. Um, and so that is the reason why AB 1400, and like I said, the union support is so important and that it is important that we also fight for unions. We know how powerful unions are. Look what just happened in Alabama with Amazon. I mean, they, that was really a big sign that unions can be very powerful. And that is the reason why corporate America is so afraid of them. 
um, because we, when we fight, we win and we fight with the union and then we can win and they don't want us to win. Um, and so that is so important. Um, but I just wanted to, sorry, I digressed. Wait, I saw something pop in. No, that's totally related. Um, if I could add one uh, idea here that I think it could be important to, um, to winning uh, Medicare for all and CalCare. And that's, um, you know, so um, traditionally the American Medical Association and doctors have been like the opposition force to universal healthcare efforts back in like the 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, and then up until just recently, uh, but now there's this change of, you know, more and more doctors, especially young doctors, are um, in support of single payer, of Medicare for all and CalCare. Um, and part of the, I think part of the, the reason it's changed, and maybe Dr. Bill has thoughts on this as well, um, is that the nature of work for younger doctors has dramatically changed uh, as more and more doctors are employees of large healthcare institutions, uh, meaning that they have uh, uh, more burnout, more they have, they're forced to see, you know, to churn through more, more patients. And it's a more stressful job uh, than it used to be where doctors had more independence to really take time with, um, with patients. And I think that um, w an opportunity here is, as far as unions go, is that, um, what if more doctors who are now employees unionized and then were able to use their voice to, to fight for change in the system and, and advocate for, um, for CalCare and Medicare for all? I don't know. Is that something that, that could happen with the younger doctors? There's, there is the Committee of Interns and Residents. Uh, it's an SEIU local uh, and they represent um, uh, you know, interns and residents, doctors. But I don't know of, um, of other doctors' unions, um, but that would be an interesting development if that were to happen. Yeah, Dr. Bill, you want to go ahead and uh, respond? Uh, sure, thanks. And I'll just quickly add, because we brought this up before, that um, the American Medical Association and the California Medical Association are not uh, unions. And um, in fact, they, they are clearly just lobbying outfits for the really high priced overpaid, mostly surgical subspecialties of medicine and uh, which are largely just strictly fee for service. So talk about, you know, cranking out cases, um, very little kind of uh, time that's spent actually um, in meaningful discussions with their patients. Um, they're all about procedure type uh, medicine. Um, but you're absolutely right, Phil, uh, you know, the the uh, the days of kind of solo practice have are are you know are over. Uh, doctors in solo practice have been pushed into group practices, which have um, made it a very different dynamic for physicians. I, I can tell you though that that there's the there's an incredible misconception about the American Medical Association that every doctor belongs to that somehow. It's not true. Only 15%, one five, 15% of practicing physicians in this country actually belong to the American Medical Association or the CMA in California. So, um, you know, more um, uh, physicians uh, uh, who belong to the, to the AMA and CMA are now turning toward, um, toward single payer type uh, solutions to the problem because of all the incredible waste of administrative costs and the fact that they're being pushed out by commercial insurance from having meaningful time uh, with their patients. So, um, so, so there is a trend, you're absolutely right, and, uh, and it's, it's moving away from uh, that policy, policy position. Um, and who knows, maybe they really could become a uh, a union for uh, physicians and other providers. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to say, you know, uh, that is really important. Like I do see, you know, working with, you know, younger doctors my age, I do see that, um, that spark there. And I think it's very possible. 
um, because we all honestly just want to care for our patients. That's really what it is. It's like, I mean, yeah, there's some of us that got into it for the money, but most of us uh, are there because we just genuinely want the well-being of our patients to be taken care of. And battling this insurance thing is what is the most draining, um, covering what's covered, what's not covered, write this, don't write that. You know, it is um, really that that draining part that takes us away from being the best that we can be for our patients. Um, and with that being said, we are at 658. So I want to thank you, Phil, so much for coming. Um, always welcome to come back. Anybody from CNA, you know, you guys, it's always an open door. If you guys want to be the host of this, let us know. You guys, this can be a CNA sponsored uh, office hours at any time. Um, like I said, that door is always open as well. Um, but, you know, we don't mind using our platform to amplify. You know, we are definitely allies and, uh, you know, that battle buddies uh in this fight yeah well i just want to say i i definitely appreciate you all and thank you so much for uh keeping this at the forefront like i said um and uh yeah maybe somebody else from our team can join you uh on one of the next ones i know you've had ryan on and, and i'm on now but maybe uh Marty's interested yeah marty um you know, you can let uh, Carmen know. We love her too. <laughs> she can jump in anytime. Uh, and we would definitely like, you just give us a date. We'll make it happen. Um, so yeah, I appreciate everybody. If you guys did enjoy this Office Hours, this 20th uh, edition of Office Hours, um, you know, feel free to donate to Healthcare for All Los Angeles. We dropped the link in the chat on Facebook. Um, you know, it is a labor of love, lots and lots of love, but you know, Zoom does cost money. So um, feel free to donate to us. Um, and we will continue to do this great work. And we're going to see you again next week. Until then, stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands. Do not make me go on a soapbox about COVID again. You guys have a great one and take care.